Um, welcome everyone. Thank you all for being here tonight and joining us for our first of our lecture series, Conservation Stories. Um, we're excited to bring these stories and the work that staff and uh, students at CalBG are doing all across California. So thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Kristen Barker. I'm the Community Education Coordinator here at the Garden. And tonight I'm just going to be helping to kind of facilitate the, this conversation by helping pro, uh, address some of the questions you might have. So I encourage you all to use the chat and Q&A features all throughout the presentation. Uh, we will pause periodically to address some of those, but we're gonna have a dedicated Q&A portion at the end of the, the presentation. So we'll address those more thoroughly there as well. Um, I'd like to also point out that we will be recording this presentation. So if you have to step away for a moment, you'll be able to uh, access that on the digital content page of our website, which is calbg.org. And that should be up and available within about 24 hours or so. So check back there. Um, and with that, I'd like to just kind of briefly introduce our speaker and our moderator for tonight. Um, our speaker is our Director of Conservation Programs here at CalBG, Naomi Fraga, and she's had a very long history here to, at the Garden, starting as a, an intern in the herbarium and now kind of just leading and directing our conservation programs here. So I'm very grateful to her to be here with us tonight to share some of the, the stories of her conservation work that's so vast and over a great period of time. So thank you for joining us. Um, and joining her tonight in conversation is our executive director here at the Garden, Lucinda McDade. So with that, I'd like to hand you over to Lucinda. Thank you for being here. Great, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for being here. Thank you for moderating and for organizing this terrific series. I just am so um, proud that we are doing this series about our conservation activities here at California Botanic Garden. Um, this is something that um, I have been uh, working with many others here at our garden to optimize for, for quite some time. And in particular with, with Naomi, uh, Naomi has been involved in conservation here at our garden for um, 10 years or so. Uh, but in the last five years since she assumed the directorship of our uh, conservation programs, she has worked very hard to basically take the conservation program and wrap it around all of our resources and programs here, or reversing what I just said, taking all of our resources and programs here and asking what can we do for conservation of California native plants with all of those resources and, um, and programs. And so the, um, the, the work that she's going to talk about today, I think is emblematic of that. And in fact, this whole series is emblematic of that because of the, the other two um, speakers thus far are actually students uh, who are currently in or recently graduated from our graduate program with master's degrees. And so the graduate program is also uh, completely intercalated and involved in our conservation program um, at, the, at the garden. Uh, Naomi has done an incredible job of pulling all of that together um, over the last five years. And I just, I could not be more uh, proud. And I'm so glad that we uh, get to share that with you here today. Um, I want to um, start before we launch into the, um, the, the, the talk um, by telling you that Dr. Naomi Fraga has a PhD in botany from Claremont Graduate University. She also has a, a master's degree. She's going to tell you toward the end of her talk about her fascination, uh, indeed love of the tiny little monkey flowers, um, now mostly genus Erythranthi, but some diplicas as well. And you will be uh, totally beguiled by these uh, terrific little plants as has been Naomi for a while. And she continues her personal research on those, on those plants even as she directs the, um, the conservation program. And I kind of want to start by throwing a question at Naomi, which is um, that Naomi has done conservation work all across the southern half or so of California. And so I kind of want to know why she decided to focus on the San Bernardino Mountains um, for this inaugural talk in our conservation series. That is an excellent question. Kristen and I talked about what would be the focus of 
the presentation for tonight. And there's, um, like you said, there's a lot of regions where I've done research, uh, but I wanted to speak about a region that is um, what a, 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 a geographic region that was important in my early years as a botanist as I grew and developed um, my passion for plant conservation. Um, it's also a mountain range that is so varied and captures all the diverse habitats that I love so much about Southern California. And so I think it's very representative of the unique challenges we face in Southern California with respect to conservation and also um, the incredible diversity that we're working to protect. So it, it's kind of the perfect setting for me to um, tell some conservation stories. That makes sense, I think. That, I think that, that makes great sense. And as our neighboring mountain range, um, it makes complete sense that uh, your work, our work has focused on that um, to some degree over the, over the years, or it's always, always been there as a major, major component of what we do. And so with that, I'm going to um, ask Naomi to launch into her lecture on the conservation in the San Bernardino Mountains. Certainly. Thank you for that introduction, Lucinda. And thank you all for attending and coming to listen to um, this story about the San Bernardino Mountains. And I hope that you, um, if you're very familiar with the San Bernardino Mountains, maybe you'll see it from a new perspective today and or we'll just um, kind of regain our appreciation for this special mountain range. But if you're not familiar with the San Bernardino Mountains, I'm sure um, I hope this talk will intrigue you to visit and to learn more about the conservation issues there. Um, before I launch into my talk, I do want to acknowledge and honor the first people of California and uh, especially the first botanists of the San Bernardino Mountains, uh, the Serrano people um, who have deep knowledge of the plants of the region, um, which is so varied and diverse. And so I hope that this talk today um, will honor their knowledge and all their contributions to stewarding uh, these magnificent plants this very special region. And so the outline of today's talk, um, we're going to take a virtual tour to some extent and botanize the San Bernardino Mountains. Uh, there are many unique physical features that make the San Bernardino Mountains so special, so we'll have a discussion about that. And then I want to place that into context um, in terms of how the San Bernardino Mountain stands out in terms of its contributions to the California flora overall. And then we will discuss um, different conservation projects that have taken place at California Botanic Garden in the mountain range. Um, some of the work that I've been able to do over the course of my time here. And that will lead us into a discussion of many of the rare and endemic plants of the region. Uh, there are many I can discuss, so I had to select a few of my favorite plants. And then finally, follow up with some of my personal research in monkey flowers and um, my personal connection to the San Bernardino Mountains. And then just kind of wrapping that all up into um, this, this story of an incredible mountain range that harbors incredible plant diversity. So we'll start off with the unique features of the San Bernardino Mountains. And I just wanna mention uh, something about this, the plant on this slide before we get into um, all those unique features of the mountain range. And this is the California dandelion, Taraxacum californicum, which is federally listed as endangered. Um, you might think that looks somewhat similar to the common dandelion, but it's actually quite distinct and it only occurs in the San Bernardino Mountains and nowhere else. You can see those bracts that surround the flower have this bluish cast to it. That's one of its distinguishing features. And the flowers, the individual flowers are quite a a pale yellow and not as strong yellow as the common dandelion. And you'll see the leaves are, um, don't have as many edges. It's much more smooth edged leaf. Um, and, but they actually hybridize with the common dandelion, which is one of the threats to this plant. But this is um, one of the plants that's incredibly endangered that we're working to protect here at California Botanic Garden uh, that's supported by an extensive meadow system. And so the unique features that we'll talk about the San Bernardino Mountains all come together to support lots of varied habitats that support special plants like this that occur nowhere else. So when we think about the state of California and 
what an incredible biodiversity hotspot it is. We have over 6,500 plants that are native to our state. Um, and we think about the diverse climate, the diverse topography and geology. And all of those same factors really contribute to the varied habitats within the San Bernardino Mountains. So here we have a map of climate of California. But if we look in at the San Bernardino Mountains here, you can see there's actually a diversity of color just within this one small region. So at the very top, you see we have colder, um, the uh, greener colors, which represent cold winter, dry summer, and um, highland timberline um, climate. And so we have that present here. And then at the edges, we have Mediterranean climate influence. And then on the north edge, we have these desert influences. And so if you travel from south to north across the San Bernardino Mountains, you'll enter all these different climate zones from Mediterranean to Alpine, then into the desert. And it's kind of like a cross section through California. And that really makes for unique upper, unique habitats and lots of sort of little pockets where a diverse plant life can occur. And this is also true for the geologic diversity. The San Bernardino Mountains has varied soil types and geology. And I chose this photograph to showcase some of the geologic diversity. This is looking um, from the north side of the mountains in this place called Lone Valley. And off into the distance here on this rock outcropping, you see these pale colored rocks. And those are limestone outcrops or carbonate rock outcrops. Um, which support a suite of plants that occur nowhere else in the world. They only occur on the carbonate outcrops of the San Bernardino Mountains. And then you get away from that and you have the more typical granite outcrops here, like on these slopes. But you have pockets of unusual rock, metamorphic, carbonate, um, and different kinds of clay soils. There's um, thick lake sediments that make these, these meadow habitats, these sort of ancient lake sediments. Um, and so there's lots of varied um, soil diversity that's underlain by diverse rock. Um, and that obviously leads to varied plant life. And then when we look at topography, we see um, in the San Bernardino Mountains, we have this whitish color here, um, and it sort of stands out across all the areas here in Southern California. And it's actually very similar to the elevation um, you would get in the Southern Sierra Nevada. And so we have the tallest peak in Southern California in the San Bernardino Mountains, Mount San Gorgonio, which stands at 11,503 feet. It's the only true alpine region in Southern California. And it's actually was the southernmost glaciated region in the Western United States. And this is evidenced from glacial valleys and cirques that are present um, in the landscape. And you can see that evidence of that past glaciation. And so you don't have that same kind of topography in the San Gabriel Mountains or in the San Jacinto Mountains, which have very steep um, slope edges and are essentially like, you know, rocks just recently up, you know, more relatively recently uplifted from the ground. Um, um, and also in the San Bernardino Mountains, you have many more gentle sloping areas. Um, so that's pretty magnificent. And because of that, we actually have many plants that are shared between the Sierra Nevada and the San Gabriel and the San Bernardino Mountains, which are not present in the San Gabriel Mountains or the San Jacinto Mountains. And so when we put this into context, when we look at the San Bernardino Mountains as it relates to the California flora, we find it turns out that there are many different kinds of vegetation types throughout. So this is a quote from um, Samuel B. Parrish. He was, um, he lived um, in San Bernardino Valley around the turn of the last century, so in the late 1800s to early 1900s, and he wrote an early flora, a relatively early flora of the San Bernardino Mountains, and he describes how um, the, um, 
he says, yet nowhere else in America, I like how he compares it to the vast <laughs> continental <laughs> North America, uh, save on the adjacent San Jacinto Mountains, is there displayed in such close conjunction, so wide a range of phytogeographic regions. And this is really true for a region in Southern California where you could take a day's drive and intersect so many different vegetation types. Um, and so in the background photograph is um, a photograph I took from within the San Bernardino Mountains looking towards um, Mount San Jacinto. So here are the San Jacinto Mountains here. And when we do an analysis of species richness across the state, we find that this is from an Atlas of Biodiversity of California that was produced by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, we find that the San Bernardino Mountains has a really high species richness. So it's this dark green blob right here and you can see it, it has many more species than in the adjacent San Gabriel Mountains and San Jacinto Mountains. And it's very comparable in species richness with the Sierra Nevada, which has been identified as a, a unique hotspot for plants in California, as well as sort of this north coastal mountain region. And so um, the San Bernardino Mountains often stand out as an important place for plants throughout the state. It's quite exceptional. And I just think that's such a wonderful opportunity uh, to be able to study the plants of this region and it being so close uh, to where we live, to where I live, um, that it's one of my favorite places to botanize. And then when we look at plants, um, that are endemic to the region. So these are plants that occur in the San Bernardino Mountains and nowhere else. We find that the San Bernardino Mountains actually has, supports many plants that have a very limited range. So we have this color ramp here, the scale that shows red to blue, with blue being plants that have smaller distributions and red being plants that are the most widespread. And so we see throughout the Mojave Desert, that there are many more widespread species, but here in the San Bernardino Mountains, we find many species with very restricted distributions that are narrow endemics. So that's actually quite special, and it's also, again, very similar to what we find in the Sierra Nevada. So oftentimes, um, botanists in history have very much compared the flora of the San Bernardino Mountains with that of the Sierra Nevada. Uh, because of these, these the similarities that they share just in shared plant diversity, um, but also um, uh, and shared sort of vegetation types and having many rare plant species. And so given that the San Bernardino Mountains are really part of um, our larger backyard here in Southern California and in our, the Claremont area. Um, it was a natural partnership for California Botanic Garden to partner with land management agencies. It's largely federally managed, the San Bernardino Mountains, managed by both the San Bernardino National Forest and the Bureau of Land Management on the more desert slopes, um, the BLM. Um, manages land. And so it was a natural partnership for us to work together to advance plant conservation through a variety of projects. Um, on this slide is um, my colleague Duncan Bell, who um, I actually um, worked with him. Uh, he started working with me around 2008 and I was able to hire him specifically because we had a large project funded through the San Bernardino National Forest and he is now our senior field botanist um, leading and executing a diversity of projects. So I'm really glad that, that those opportunities allowed me to hire someone like Duncan. And so one of our large extensive projects, I remember this was actually a project where it was Duncan's first opportunity to lead field teams and we had um, a fairly uh, large project to execute and I couldn't lead all the field teams by myself so I had to make sure Duncan had all the proper training and I kind of sent him off to to lead these field teams and to survey all throughout the upper Santa Ana River watershed. And so this was a project done in partnership with the San Bernardino National Forest where they needed surveys done in anticipation of fuels treatments. So when I talk about fuels treatments, I'm talking about vegetation management related to, um, to, to having to deal with fire in our landscape. So that might be thinning and or um, other sorts of vegetation treatments. And in anticipation of that work, um, surveys need to be done 
to um, flag invasive plant populations so those aren't spread during those types of activities, but also to um, flag rare plant populations to ensure that those are buffered and not impacted during various kinds of um, vegetation treatments. And so this was a multi-year project across 40,000 acres. And in doing that, we documented 750 plants, because we didn't just document the rare plants or the invasive plants, we really conducted an inventory throughout the, the scope of the project area. And it turns out this region is so diverse and rich, um, it incorporates so many different kinds of habitats, from very wet meadow habitat to also chaparral slopes, um, all different kinds of coniferous forest, um, mixed coniferous forest, oak woodland, chaparral, meadows, uh, carbonate, I also had um, carbonate rock outcropping supporting some of the carbonate species, um, and several rare plants, 56 rare plants for this area. I mean, 56 rare plants for a single mountain range would be a significant number of rare plants, but this is just within one section of the mountain range. And many of these rare plants only occur in this specific area and don't occur throughout the whole mountain range. So it was quite exceptional. And one of those rare plants that only occurs in this geographic area is the Barton Flats Herculia, Herculia wilderae, which is endemic to the upper Santa Ana River watershed um, in and around Barton Flats, it turns out. Um, it's a quite a special little plant um, that I really uh, enjoyed surveying for. And so another project that was uh, similar in scope in terms of the size of the area was um, to do work in support of increasing our understanding of the Bighorn Mountain wilderness. And so this was not related to fuels or vegetation treatment at all. This was just to conduct an inventory to understand the plants of this wilderness area so the wilderness area could have better stewardship. And so this, we did this work in partnership with the San Bernardino National Forest and the Bureau of Land Management because the wilderness spans those two management units. And this is on the north side of the mountain range where there's lots of desert vegetation. And in this area, we encountered lots of those carbonate endemics, those plants endemic to carbonate rock. Um, that occur on that white colored rock. And for a desert flora, we actually found this area to be very diverse. Uh, 698 different kinds of plants were documented over the course of the study. And so this is on a similar scale of the upper Santa Ana River watershed um, and being almost 40,000 acres and had almost similar levels of diversity, which I think is quite incredible given that the other site had lush meadows and creeks and, and lots of water, which typically support more plant diversity. But I think the Billy Corn Mountain Wilderness was quite varied. It supports so many plant taxa because there's a, a great elevational gradient. There's lots of different kinds of substrates. So it supports lots of different kinds of communities from creosote bush scrub to pinyon and juniper woodland. Um, and so uh, we found lots of different kinds of plants. And uh, another thing I want to mention about these two floristic projects that we undertook is that for each one, we actually documented things that were wholly new for the San Bernardino Mountains, new records or range extensions, which is quite remarkable given that relative to other mountain ranges in Southern California, the San Bernardino Mountains is relatively well documented. If you're a botanist living in Southern California, you've likely done some kind of work or exploring in the San Bernardino Mountains. And so there's been lots of botanical collectors, lots of botanists who have studied this flora and this vegetation, and yet we're still finding um, range extensions, new plant records, and so there's still lots to learn. Naomi, I wanted to ask you, I think that's a perfect segue to my question, which was when you started on the Upper Santa Ana River um, watershed project, did you know that all 56 of those rare plants were there? Did you have a working list? How many of them were not known at all and were discovered by you and your, your teams as the project went along? We certainly knew that the majority were there, um, that there was, we did have a checklist and historical records of many of the rare plant populations. And there were, in fact, some rare, rare plant populations that we were not able to relocate, some populations that are still a mystery today. So in that upper Santa Ana River watershed, uh, there was a historical record for a fern called 
Dryopteris felix moss. And it's not a rare plant by any means. It's actually quite widespread, but it was the only known record for it in Southern California in the San Bernardino Mountains. And it was a very old record um, from San, I don't know if it was Samuel B. Parrish, but it was, it was a, an old record that was well over, you know, 50 years old, probably about 100 years old. We were not able to relocate it, even though the location in which it was documented from was still perfectly fine and intact, although the location was quite vague and ambiguous. And then there was also another record for a rare plant called Podestra nevidensis, which was thought to be to occur on the summit of Sugarloaf Mountain, which was in our study area. We also never found that either. And it was also just one singular record that documented that plant for the whole mountain range. And that is still a mystery. And sometimes it might be, I don't know if those plants were mislabeled some time ago, but it's hard to know and we'll still continue to look for them. I don't think we'll ever stop looking for them because as long as there's some record indicating they could have occurred there, we have to keep looking. Um, so it is surprising to me that- huh? I was just gonna say, when you say record, you mean a oh. piece of paper somewhere? You mean- a, Yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> the record is a herbarium record. So it's a dried press plant specimen that lives in a, Natural History Museum, not we have one, which has over 1.2 million specimens. Um, it, they didn't necessarily occur in our herbarium, um, but we were able to verify those records and verify the identification through photographs um, that they were correct. Um, and so someone would have transcribed information onto a label and glued it on the archival piece of paper along with the specimen. And sometimes people get things mixed up and or labels mixed up. So we, we don't necessarily know what happened there, um, but there's still mysteries and um, we did, I'm sure we did find records of plants that hadn't previously occurred there. It's hard to recollect what those specific, specific examples might be because it turns out that we often find new occurrences of rare plants in places where they weren't previously known. And it actually, I find it to be the first, you know, as this, when you're a budding botanist, as you find new records of rare plants, it's really exciting to find a new piece of information and you feel like you're contributing knowledge and which you really are, you're contributing new knowledge. Um, and you think it's quite special that maybe no one has ever done that before, but it turns out it happens a lot <laughs> all the time because we have so much to, it's just because we have so much to learn and we need more botanists out there gathering data. And it is quite a special thing and it's great to contribute that knowledge, but it all, sometimes it, you find so many new rare plant populations, it's hard to keep track of all the new ones you found. <laughs> Um, so we did those two floristic projects, um, but then we also do have done a lot of work um, after significant fires in the mountain range. So we know that this year has been um, really a tremendous year, um, uh, really a record-breaking year for fires in the western United States, and that for for the most part in Southern California, this is a regular occurrence that we know nearly every year there's a fire somewhere in our Southern California mountains. And it happens quite frequently in the San Bernardino mountains. And one of the first large projects I had was to survey post-fire in the old and Grand Prix fire complex, which were two fires that merged together and spanned the San Bernardino mountains and San Gab Eastern San Gabriel mountains. And that was a really exciting project because it was such a large area, it was my first large, um, really sort of mega survey project that I was managing. And um, I got to survey many rare plant populations and learn a lot about post-fire vegetation in Southern California. Um, so that was one of the first projects I undertook that really, I think, um, helped form me as a botanist. And then subsequent to that, we've done a numerous uh, post fire surveys and um, most recently we did the lake fire which 
got burned in 2015 and we did our surveys in 2016 and then the pilot fire in 2016 and we did those surveys in 2017. And very likely next year in 2021, we'll be surveying the apple fire, which will be challenging because it's very rugged. It's oftentimes in very rugged terrain, very difficult to access areas um, where we are um, surveying dozer lines, areas where um, firefighting activity had taken place to document invasive plant populations um, for their eventual removal so they don't spread as the habitat recovers following fire and also to document the status of our plants following fire. But we do this close work with the San Bernardino National Forest and one of the things, um, one of the reasons I know why they really like to partner with us is because we often go above and beyond just the surveys of rare plants and invasive plants and really do the work to do full floristic documentation and to develop a comprehensive checklist for the area that was affected. And so that is um, something we're, we're well known for and active in doing. Naomi, if I remember correctly on some of these um post-burn surveys, your uh, interns have been heavily involved. Is that right? And say a few words about um, your internship program. Yes, that is true. And so every summer, unfortunately, except for this summer, due to um, ongoing circumstances related to our current situation in the pandemic, but in all prior years, we, we, we have um, interns that, that work with us each summer, and we do a lot of work to mentor them and to um, show them all the diverse ways uh, a botanic garden can participate in the world of plant conservation. And one of the many ways we do plant conservation work is to be on the ground doing surveys to check on the status of plants. And so we always have them out with us doing field work and oftentimes they'll participate in these kinds of field projects, which is really exciting for them uh, because it is oftentimes in just really remote and rugged locations not on trail, it's always off trail because we have to go where the fire burn. And so um, many of our interns are new to exploring wilderness areas. And so it's quite an adventure and very exciting as we take them out into these really uh, diverse landscapes. I would like to mention that Duncan um, was an intern when he started with me back around 2007 and 2008. And uh, eventually um, now, you know, as I mentioned, now he's a senior field botanist. And then just, I was actually also an intern and did some of these post-fire surveys as an intern. And obviously uh, it's worked out quite well for me um, in terms of where I'm at today. Uh, and so I know that these are very important experiences for our interns in as they grow and learn about California landscapes, understanding impacts of um, events like fire and subsequent management and how a botanic garden can contribute to the overall recovery and conservation of these areas. Yeah, we do some really um, remote hiking up there. It's pretty amazing. And um, so now I would like to transition and talk a little bit about some of the rare and endemic plants of the San Bernardino Mountains, there's so many, so it was kind of hard for me to pick and choose um, some of the plants that um, occur there, but I chose some of my favorites, including this ash gray paintbrush, uh, Castilea cyanurea. This plant is really um, a really good example of one of the special specialized endemics um, to the San Bernardino Mountains. It's restricted and only lives in the San Bernardino Mountains and it occurs in a special habitat called Pebble Plains. Pebble Plains are these areas that have these clay soils that exclude trees because they hold too much moisture for the tree roots. And so it excludes trees and then it's overlain, the clay soil is overlain by these quartz pebbles. And so there are these plains, these relatively flat areas covered by pebbles, so they got the name Pebble Plains. And they're open without tree cover. And they support a suite of, of many um, rare plants, including this ash gray paintbrush. And the cool thing about this photograph and the ash gray paintbrush, one is you can see these cool little beetles doing some action here on, um, this is actually the, so this is actually the bract, and it's not part of the, it's not really, you know, a formal flower part. And the flower is actually tucked inside that bract and it's not very showy. 
and it's this little part that's sticking out. And so that's the cool thing about paintbrushes is that the very showy part that we see are bracts and the flowers are usually small and green and tucked away inside. Um, but I really like this paintbrush because it actually comes in two colors. It comes in this pink color and then there are versions of it that are yellow that have yellow bracts. Um, but it's always it has these very these cool glands and and crazy hairs and uh, it's just one of the really interesting plants of the San Bernardino Mountains. The Baldwin Lake Linanthus is also restricted to the San Bernardino Mountains. It only occurs in the, San, in the Baldwin Lake area and nowhere else. So this is more the desert side of the mountain range and it occurs generally in the understory of Pinion Woodland um, and also in sort of mixed coniferous forest, but sort of the drier forest. Um, and it's very small. Um, you can see I have a pencil here for scale. Um, and this is another one that is also comes in two colors. It normally is in this white color, but there are also um, occasional pink versions you can find um, very rarely, but occasionally in the mountain range. Um, and this is one of my favorite rare plants. It's an annual in the Phlox family um, and very, very sweet. The San Bernardino Mountains Owl's Clover, Castilea laziorinca. This is uh, another annual and it's more of a wetland species. So this is one you'll find at the edges of meadows and along vernal, vernally wet um, creek channels, um, oftentimes in the understory of coniferous forest. It has these really cute uh, yellow flowers and these fuzzy bracts. And it's um, similar to the other paintbrush I mentioned. I didn't mention this about the other paintbrush, but paintbrushes are um, partially parasitic. And so they actually attach to the roots of other plants and get um, food and energy from other plants. So even though this is pretty green, it probably does a lot of its, makes a lot of its own food, but it probably gets its start early in life by taking some nutrients from another plant. Um, so it's in the Orobanki family, the broomrape family. This is um, Cushionberry milk vetch, Astragalus albans. This is one of the plants that is endemic to the carbonate rock outcroppings. And so there are a number of plants that only occur on the white carbonate rock on the north side of the mountain. And it turns out um, many of these plants are highly threatened and endangered because this rock is highly sought, af out, sought after. And there are very large mines mining this rock. And so Astragalus albans is federally listed um, under the Endangered Species Act because it is threatened by mining activity. And um, the, the carbonate rock is mined for cement. So there are large cement plants on the north side of the mountains, including um, the Mitsubishi Mining Corporation has a very large and extensive mine, um, which has impacted these plants greatly. These are really big, large industrial mining projects that take up a big portion of the north side of the San Bernardino Mountains and um, facilitated the needing to have these plants listed under the Endangered Species Act because they needed some form of protection. So turns out the San Bernardino Mountains actually has a high number of plants listed under the Endangered Species Act. Another one, another plant that is one of these plants restricted to carbonate rock is uh, Parrish's daisy. Um, it's also federally listed. This is listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Um, this species is not as rare as the Astragalus albans. It's a little bit more widespread and it actually is not entirely restricted to carbonate rock. It also occurs on um, metamorphic rock, um, include, it occurs on gneiss. Um, and we actually found many more occurrences of this plant in the Bighorn Mountain wilderness that weren't previously documented. And I've done other work with this species in, in partnership with Tasha Ledoux in Joshua Tree National Park, where we were able to relocate it in Joshua Tree National Park. Um, it wasn't really well documented there. And in Joshua Tree and in the Bighorn Mountain Wilderness, it occurs on these metamorphic rocks. Um, but in the um, western edge of the San Bernardino Mountains, it occurs more in the carbonate rock. And its largest populations are in the carbonate rock. 
So it's still very threatened by the mine the mines. This is one of my favorite plants of the Southern California. This is the lemon lily and it's a rare plant, but it's not restricted to the San Bernardino Mountains. It actually occurs um, across the, the transverse ranges in Southern California. So it also occurs in the San Gabriel Mountains and in the San Jacinto Mountains. And in fact, in the San Jacinto Mountains, they have a lemon lily festival dedicated to this plant. Um, but it um, lives in meadows and just makes a profusion of beautiful yellow flowers. Who, I mean, who doesn't love a lily? And then to find these lush, beautiful lilies in lush, beautiful meadows in Southern California can be really surprising to some people that we, that this mountain range supports um, plant diversity like this. And then we have uh, the vanishing buckwheat, uh, Ariagonum evanitum. Uh, this is in the Polygonaceae. So the vanishing buckwheat is a species that was relatively recently described. It was described in the, I believe in the early 2000s by um, the, um, plant taxonomist who was a specialist in the genus Ariagonum, his name was Jim Reveal. And when he described it, he determined that he thought that this species might actually be extinct or going extinct. And when we saw the, the note for this in the publication, we thought we saw the locations at which it historically grew at based on the herbarium specimens. And we just knew, just knowing the lay of the land in the San Bernardino Mountains, we knew that there was a high chance that we'd be able to relocate them, even though the occurrences, the, the documentation of it was quite old. And so we set out on a project to relocate the species throughout its range in Southern California, and we we're actually able to relocate it at most of the sites. And then we were able to publish that work um, where we labeled the, the title of our manuscript was the uh, reappearance of the vanishing buckwheat. And so that was kind of a, a conservation success story where we were able to update the information and actually provide new um, surveys that um, was able to update the conservation status of this plant. And it turns out it wasn't threatened with extinction at all. But in fact, um, it is still, it does have threats, um, but um, it's alive and well, and there's a lot we can do to support this plant to ensure that it is here for future generations. Naomi, are you, are you cl clear why Jim Reveal was so convinced that it was likely to be going extinct? He, he felt that it was going extinct because the, all the records were so old. Mm. I think he thought that if it was around, botanists would have picked it up um, in a more recent record, except that it occurs, it blooms very late in the year. It blooms in August and September. And there's a lot fewer botanists out on the landscape in the fall months versus in the spring months. Um, not as many, I, I, I love to be out in the fall months, <laughs> but um, it turns out um, a lot of the rigorous collecting takes place in the early spring. And the other thing is when we've actually saw this plant on the landscape, it's hard, to, well, you can kind of see here, those tepals, the, the, the flowers are very small, the plant, the leaves are very small. It, it kind of, so this photo was taken, at, it was a summer rain event happened, and so the soil got dark, and so there's more contrast here. But when the soil is dry, it is very difficult to see this plant. You have to be with an eagle eye, and you have to be intentionally looking for it to really find it. And it probably had so few records in the herbarium record because it was just those eagle eye botanists that zoomed in on it that were able to pick it up but many people just walking around would never notice it or pay much attention to it. And so I think he just thought it was going extinct because it really wasn't present in the herbarium record. But many of the plants that you've showed us images of and talked about are really rare, right, and are threatened. You've talked about mines, mining as, um, as threats. What are some of the other threats that, um, that you feel are uh, impacting the plants and, and the San Bernardinos as a whole? Sure, um, I'm gonna go back to the lemon lily as an example. I also mentioned the California dandelion earlier and the um, San Bernardino owl's clover. All those species occur in wet habitats like meadows and streams. 
And there's been a lot of alteration of the natural hydrology in this region. And so meadows that were once wet have become drier. And this is in part due to development in the region that alters water flow and natural flow um, throughout the area. And, and so um, hydrological restoration is something that's gonna be really important for a lot of these plants, especially as we continue to experience increased drought um, in our region. Um, and um, that's especially something we're seeing with the uh, California dandelion. Um, it's actually of major concern because populations that maybe a decade or two decades ago had hundreds of plants have dwindled to seemingly have just dozens of plants. And that's not due to a lack of protection. The land they occur on is actually protected, but the meadows are drying. And so, um, there may be a seed bank there that if hydrology were restored, perhaps plants could rebound. And we actually, one thing I haven't really talked about is in our conservation program, we're actively seed banking many of these species. And we have um, the genetic diversity, we have the seeds stored off site in case there is a need for restoration and active restoration can happen. We have the genetic material to support those efforts. And in particular, that's something we're working on with the California dandelion where we actually have extensive collections in our seed bank to support future conservation and restoration of that species. Um, so uh, the meadows are pretty um, threatened due to this altered hydrology. And then if you've ever been up to the San Bernardino Mountains, you probably would have visited the town of Big Bear and you would have seen Big Bear Lake. Um, Big Bear Lake is not a natural lake. Um, that is a man a reservoir. Um, that has been around for quite a long time, but underneath that lake was meadow habitat. Um, and there's also ongoing development in the region. And so even though it's not a dense urban area, uh, development is still impacting many of these plants. And then it's also um, the San Bernardino National Forest and the Bureau of Land Management are managed for multiple use. So they're not necessarily national parks managed primarily to preserve or protect. There, there are a variety of uses that take place on the forest, which might um, have some adverse impacts on the plant diversity, and it could include off-highway vehicle use, uh, grazing, mining, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, and other kinds of um, habitat alteration. So there's really a diverse suite of threats across the landscape to these plants, not to mention if we have increasing wildfire um, that might sort of be at greater intervals than what might have been seen historically as now, you know, climate change is this emerging threat that's a very real threat that these plants will be facing. So um, finally, I would like to take you all um, on a little tour of some of my research um, that has taken place in the San Bernardino Mountains, and I've done a lot of work um, looking at monkey flowers. So I studied monkey flowers for my dissertation, um, my dissertation research, and it turns out uh, several of the species I studied occurred in the San Bernardino Mountains, and a few of them are rare. And so I um, just want to tell you a little bit about them. This is me back in maybe like 20, 2010, I want to say 2010, um, where I was, so that's 10 years ago, wow. But I was there, I still do the same thing. You can still find me to this day doing the same thing, looking, bending over, looking at teeny tiny monkey flowers. And so you can see all the little purple cast of characters there, just two, there's two species. There's a rare facilia and a little purple monkey flower. Uh, but there's about 20 different monkey flowers that occur in the San Bernardino Mountains, lots of monkey flower plants and species, and three of them are rare. And so we often do rare plant surveys for some of these monkey flowers. And so I just want to introduce you to a few of them. Some of them are, this one is the most, takes the cake, the award for a rid most ridiculously small monkey flower that ever lived, uh, Erythranthe exigua, the eye strain monkey flower, and also best common name that accurately describes <laughs> the plant. Um, I was with Joy England, who's one of our botanists, uh, when I found, we found this population together. 
I remember we spent, I think, over an hour or two crouched down just counting little plants and finding just a, a, a tiny world opened up to us where there was a great diversity of tiny, teeny tinies. Um, and we had to be very careful to make sure we could count them all and document them all. Um, and amongst the teeny tinies was the ice train monkey flower, um, which, you know, it, it has a, a thread like stem that holds on to a couple of leaves and a tiny, teeny tiny flower. Um, but there it is in all its glory. Um, and it is one of my favorite things to find because, I mean, when you can find that, you feel like you've, you should get a prize. <laughs> uh, Diplicus Johnstoni is a monkey flower. It's an annual monkey flower related. To, it looks similar to Bigelow's monkey flower because it's closely related to Bigelow's monkey flower. Um, and it is endemic to the transverse range. Um, and it occurs on these really steep gravelly slopes that are very, very dry. Um, I just find its habitat to be so amazing, kind of like steep talus slopes. Um, and so I always enjoy when I find uh, Diplicus Johnstoni. Johnston's monkey flower named after Ivan Johnston, who was a botanist who grew up in Upland and went to Pomona College and he eventually ended up at Harvard. But he documented a lot of plants in Southern California while he was here. And then that photo of me looking at monkey flowers, I was looking at this guy, little um, flower, Erythranthi purpurea, little purple monkey flower. Um, this plant has an interesting distribution because it's primarily, it occurs in the San Bernardino Mountains, but then it skips a whole big area and then the next place where it occurs is down in Baja California and Mexico in the Sierra San Pedro Martir, which has habitat that's very analogous, very similar to the San Bernardino Mountains. And it occurs no place in between San Bernardino Mountains and Sierra San Pedro Martir, except, except I still need to get the information, uh, Jim Entre was out, oh, I think it was in 2018. 2018, people found all kinds of weird monkey flower populations in unusual places in California, and they sent them to me. Jim Andre found what looks to be this little purple monkey flower in the Tehachapis, which would be a whole new place. So that's really cool. And actually, um, need to decide how to do more research on that, because <laughs> it needs to be investigated. Um, to see how differentiated, if these are in fact um, have common origin, or if there could be little purple monkey flowers in all these different areas that are not necessarily closely related, but they just kind of all look similar. Um, so that's something I need to do more research on. You know, you do a whole, a, a, a lot of work on your, on to work towards a PhD and you end up coming out with more questions sometimes than answers. And one of the main species I studied um, during my dissertation research was this one, Erythranthi palmeri, Palmer's monkey flower. And it turns out when I started my study, Erythranthi palmeri occurred from San Diego County to Monterey County. And then after my study, Erythranthi palmeri was restricted to the San Bernardino Mountains and San Gabriel Mountains. Um, and I actually described many species and pulled out many populations that weren't, turned out to not be Palmer's monkey flower. They were distinct entities. And so I described um, two, three, two, two species and resurrected three um, from the Palmer's monkey flower. And um, so Palmer's monkey flower, the, the collection that bears the name, like the original collection from which it was described was collected along Deep Creek on the north side of the San Bernardino Mountains. So that is um, Palmer's monkey flower, um, definitely occurs in the San Bernardino Mountains. Um, so to summarize, um, you know, we took, took this trip to the San Bernardino Mountains and we learned that it's incredibly diverse. It's such an incredibly diverse place and this is 
just a hop, skip, and a jump from my home here. I live in Pomona near Claremont, and I feel so incredibly fortunate that I can study uh, this vast, beautiful mountain range that's so varied, um, and it has an incredible number of plant species, so many rare and endemic species that need study so that we can ensure protection for their future. Uh, because there's diverse land use in this region and not all land use is compatible with plants. And so we need to kind of manage that and understand um, how to best protect plants so they, to ensure that they um, don't go extinct. We really are dealing with plants that are very vulnerable to extinction because they occur in such a localized area. And so when you overlay impacts onto a plant that has a very tiny home, you could see how um, endangerment um, threats, these threats can severely endanger the future of a flora. Um, and so really there's, there's been a lot of botanists, a lot of really incredible botanists who have done work in the San Bernardino Mountains. And I've spent a lot of time there. My early years as a botanist have been there, but I'm always learning more every time I explore this mountain range. And I know that there will be future botanists, um, you know, 10, 20, 30, 100 years from now, who will find things um, that we didn't know about in modern times and in, in our time today. And a lot of that is just, you know, nature is dynamic and things change and plants also move. Um, you know, it's hard to think about it in terms of our time scale through our lifetime, but I've certainly seen um, landscape scale change, change in vegetation related to whether it's fire or other land use. Um, you know, nature is not static. And so you can't say uh, this study took place and call it a day and you have this list and you carry it forward with you, you know, and, and this is the list forever. Um, things change and we need to constantly be studying our natural environment so we can understand how those changes might be impacting or you know, what land use is impacting rare plant diversity, what's the, the current status of rare plant populations and um, what can we do as a work that we can do to enhance their future. So um, I just want to thank um, a few of my collaborators. I mentioned Duncan Bell earlier. Uh, Leroy Gross is, um, he worked with me on the Vanishing Buckwheat and he's an excellent botanist here at the garden who has made a lot of important contributions to our projects. And Scott Eliason um, is a really important partner working with us on the San Bernardino National Forest who has um, really facilitated a lot of our work. And so I really um, appreciate the collaboration of all these folks, because um, obviously no one botanist, um, you know, makes um, sort of, obviously we make discoveries and contributions, but it's really as a community um, and, and our team here at California Botanic Garden um, is how we um, make uh, important advances in plant conservation. Thanks. Uh, we have questions I have yeah. to answer. Thank you, Naomi. Um, some questions that you know, what you just touched on, someone asked, will these plants be able to adapt to the change in the climate or will we see new species arise? That's a, 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 diff, a very difficult question. And in a lot of ways, it, it's unknowable um, because we don't know, we've done, you know, there's many studies that have done um, modeling to do sort of look at, predict how distributions will change with respect to climate change. And a lot of that is based on where we know plants occur now. And that a lot of times makes assumptions about, you know, what we think plants are adapted to. The thing that I find so amazing about plants is how incredibly resilient they are and the range of conditions that they can occur in. And so while we predict that climate change and, and all the different, you know, rapid change that's taking place in our world will certainly have a significant impact on plant diversity. And what we hope we're, you know, what we might be facing is potentially um, mass extinction events. Um, I don't know that we will necessarily see a lot of this within our own lifetime because in plants, 
one thing that I think is important to recognize is that plant extinction is so latent. It's not immediate. You know, plants are long lived. They can hang on in an environment for quite a long time. And so it, while rapid change might be happening, populations might be decreasing or plants, plant health might be impacted, that's not always immediately obvious to those, even the most keen observer. So um, it's hard to know what, we'll what changes we'll see in our lifetime, but I do think, I do know that we will see change, but I have hope and I do appreciate the great um, adaptive potential of plants and also their ability to disperse and occasionally show up in places you didn't know about before. Right. Kind of going along with that, um, there's a question. Do you think that any of the plants that you mentioned will be able to be domesticated to encourage gardeners to plant more native plants on their properties? That's a good question. I, mean, I have this plant right here on my screen, um, Echinocereus mojavensis, Mojave Mound Cactus. Uh, you know, we, I don't, uh, I do think we could grow uh, many cacti from seed and um, these are very drought adapted plants. I want to be careful about why I say this because it turns out cacti are a highly sought after group that people poach for horticultural purposes. So I'm certainly not ever encouraging any sort of activities like that. But I know that people also adore cacti and um, that this is a particularly showy one um, that I would love to have in my yard. Um, but yeah, so there, we've only scratched the surface on um, what plants are really available in the horticultural trade. It's a very um, select set of diversity that some number of horticulturalists decided they wanted to actively grow these plants. And we have over 6,500 kinds of plants. Um, but I also do want to um, think about sort of caution against sort of widespread movement of plants through the horticultural trade because it we need to consider how that might impact native plant populations. Um, so for instance, um, the bush monkey flower, um, Diplicus orientiacus species complex is readily available in horticulture and they've been hybridized and they've also been highly utilized in roadside projects. And we don't really know how that has um, the, the impacts there might be to native populations in terms of hybridization with horticultural varieties. So that's also something to consider. But I do think there's a lot of potential for increasing um, horticultural use of native plants, integrating them into our landscape um, because we can promote pollinators, we can reduce water use, um, and there's just so many benefits to native plant gardening that it's something important that we do need to promote, but we need to promote it responsibly. I'll give my vote for the next plant champion that I think should um, be available in horticulture. <laughs> and this is a plant I actually have in my yard, but I don't think it's readily available. And that Salvia pachyphila rosage is uh, quite. I would also um, uh, say that those two um, paint brushes that Naomi showed, she mentioned that they're partially parasitic. They need a host plant. So you can't just take seeds of them and put them into your garden and expect them necessarily to, to grow well. So there are some that are very challenging. And then the annuals, Naomi also pointed to a number of annuals. And Naomi, you've got a great question from Natasha about how the eye strain monkey flower <sighs> gets pollinated. <laughs> Is there an insect that small? Um, but those things also being annual, some of them have very peculiar requirements to get the seeds to germinate. So that can also be challenging. Yeah, well, let me go to the eye strain monkey flower very quickly. Um, Don't strain your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a special interest in the pollination of monkey flowers. And I have spent many hours making pollinator observations. And one thing um, that we've learned, we, we do know that um, monkey flowers are self-compatible. So that means that they can self-pollinate and set viable seed. So they can do 
through their own pollination. And another thing that I learned as a part of my research is that the smaller the flower, the closer the male and female parts are to one another and the easier self-pollination is. And I would say the eye strain monkey flower is probably an example of a mixed mating system where certainly has a strong ability to self-pollinate, but I have seen tiny flies and small beetles that can still visit these flowers. And so I don't think it's exclusively self-pollinating. I think it has enough insect visitation that certainly it gets cross-pollination, but because it's so small and the flowers are not showy, if an insect passes it by, it can still make seed through self-pollination. Very cool. <laughs> Naomi, if I could say one more thing, I, or ask one more question, because we're running out of time, but um, you've talked about going all over the San Bernardinos, um, and um, I know that you and your colleagues have done all of this with uh, permits. Sometimes we hear about how hard it is to get permits, but I know that you've been very um, diligent and extremely um, responsible in terms of uh, always having the proper permits for all the work that, that you've done. Um, and I suspect that part of why you've been so successful at that is because of the partnerships that you have built. Just say a few words about the importance of doing things legally and say a few words about um, the importance of building partnerships. Yeah, um, I, I think um, that is something that I work very hard on is to establish relationships and partnerships with um, communities, land managers, individuals, um, it builds a sense of trust and understanding of common goals. Um, it allows for teamwork and to make sure that your information is being communicated to relevant parties so that it can be, it can have more usefulness. Um, and um, you, you don't wanna kind of do your work in a silo sort of on your own island because then you're the only one who really knows about it. And really, for me, the purpose of doing this work is to ensure that there's a future for these plants. And the only way we can ensure there's a future for these plants is if we have a community engaged in their protection. Um, and it's really important to do things above board and through permits to ensure that, that there is that trust and that uh, people know that you are um, diligent about protocols and um, have a, that you will also then, when you have a permit, you communicate back to the agency about what you collected and where, and it's also a data sharing process. And Naomi, just briefly, uh, last question here. We had some questions about internships, and I just wanna make sure that everyone sees those answers. Just asking, when do uh, applications typically open and then do interns have to be a current student with an affiliated or with an affiliated college program? Sure. Um, we have multiple internships that might run throughout the year, but our sort of flagship internship is a summer internship program. And usually we have, um, ad we advertise for that internship in April. We would interview in May and the interns start in June and, and it takes place 10 weeks across the summer. And we advertise that on our website. And I also flag it to a lot of local schools, including community colleges, Cal States, all the local universities. It's not a requirement to be an active student. I would say the primary requirement for our internship is to be actively engaged and interested in plant conservation and have a very strong desire to learn and to want to um, be engaged in a active conservation community because we really take um, mentoring um, our interns quite seriously. It's, it's a, so fulfilling and, and it's an exciting process for me to um, see, be engaged with people who are um, learning and experiencing some of these things for the first time. And um, it just, you know, we want active, engaged individuals. Right. Great. Well, I think that was all the questions that we had and it's about just past seven o'clock. So Naomi, thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing 
some of the amazing work that you're doing just in the San Bernardino Mountain, but all across California. And Lucinda, thank you for moderating this evening with Naomi. I appreciate you both being here. Pleasure. And before I let everyone go, I just want to mention that this is a three-part series so far. We have um, two more scheduled. It's going to be the third Tuesday of every month. Next month in October, on October 20th, it's going to be with former graduate of the CalBG program, Sophie Winitsky, and she'll be discussing the uh, Adobe Valley. And then uh, in November, we have our current graduate student, Maria Jesus, who will be talking about her work in the um, conglomerate mesa in the Inyo Mountain uh, range. So that is, those are both coming up and we'd love to have you all join us for those as well. And to mention that Naomi will join us again for both of those as our moderator for those talks. So you will be able to see Naomi again. Um, and yeah, with that, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. And thank you to both you, Naomi and Lucinda for being here. Thanks for the opportunity. And thanks everyone for coming. Thanks everyone, especially Naomi. Thanks, Kristen. See you soon. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.